Hi, I'm Daniel, and today I'll talk about um, dynamic pricing with bandits, which is a use case that we've been working on at Fiber. Um, I'm Daniel, a data scientist at Fiber. Alongside me, we have Uri, which I believe most of you already know. Cool, so uh, agenda for today. We'll start with a brief overview about what Fiber is, what do we do. Then we'll dive into some business use case or specific use case, which will focus on the ad side, on the advertiser side. We'll then uh, have a deep dive on the main challenges that a bidder and advertiser focuses on. Then we'll go into a more detailed uh, specific use case of this, of this session, which is common approaches to pricing. We'll dive into contextual bandits, which is the main uh, topic and the main thing we actually took to, to investigate and research about. Wrap up with some key takeaways, and then we'll have a coding example, uh, which Uri will present some code that we actually worked on. So we'll be able to see something that in hand. Cool. Uh, fiber overview. So fiber, uh, how many of you here know fiber? Nice. Not too much, but cool. Uh, fiber is an ad tech company dealing in the space of uh, mobile mostly, as opposed to, for example, Tabula, who um, works mostly on web. So we're dealing in the space between publishers, which are app developers and advertisers and connecting between both via RTB, real-time bidding for those who know. We're a global company, most of the employees are like tech, meaning we're a very tech company, R&D product. Um, and yep, that's like the slide that actually describes the scale of our data. Not sure it's the scale of Tabula's data, but still. Um, basically, we're talking about 30 billion auctions per day, and an auction, I'll describe what it is in a bit. Thousands of applications being integrated uh, via our platform, and we have like a lot of, we can say, dimensions and metrics we can use, which you can slice and dice the data and analyze accordingly. Tons of uh, yeah, user level dimensions and terrors of bid requests being processed every day, so the data is pretty huge. So the business use case. So as I said, we'll focus mostly on the advertiser side. And basically, there is some kind of a sales funnel uh, as you can see, CPM, CPC, CPA, where the more deep you are in this sales funnel, the more expensive the ad is. And uh, basically, today we'll focus on CPC, which is for our use case the most common one. So let's talk about CPC for one second. CPC stands for cost per click. Um, and basically, most of the users, I believe most of you as well, um, do not click on an ad when they see it. And payment is done basically only when there is a click. And most of the algorithms in this space are about uh, CTR optimization, click-through rate, as I believe some of you may know. So a naive basic example, given a specific user and given a model that knows something about the attributes and something about the user, uh, he's, he will try to fit a relevant ad, which will eventually get to a prediction or non-prediction event. And that is something that as a, as a naive example of this C CTR algos. Second main aspect of the business is called real-time bidding or RTB for short. And uh, in simple words, it's basically some kind of a competition between uh, some advertisers, specific advertisers who are willing to bid uh, based on a user's um, behavior or some kind of a user's attributes or in a more, more general term, term, context. So given, let's say, I don't know, the purple bidder, for example, didn't want to bid, on a specific user, maybe because that advertiser advertisers, uh, advertises student loans, for example, and the users that just arrived at this moment is aged 60. So it's like real-time bidding. As opposed to that, we have the blue and the black bidders who actually wanted to bid. So it's really depend on the context. Cool, now we'll describe some main challenges that a bidder and advertiser faces, and we'll briefly go through each of them. Uh, so we have user filtering, ad user matching, and auction pricing, which is the main uh, context for today's session. Cool, so user filtering. Basically, user filtering is like answering the, the basic question of, as a bidder, do I want that user, yes or no, or that context, we can say. So it really depends, and there are several considerations that, we, that uh, an advertiser should take in place. For example, user history. What did this user do in the past? Um, timing, let's say now it's 3 a.m. Uh, and the user is like, um, I don't know, the advertisement is uh, on a restaurant and some pickup from a restaurant, but the restaurant is currently closed, something like that. So it might be 
irrelevant for the user, right? Click fraud. Uh, did this user was fraudulent in the past for some reason? Legal limitations, and there are many in the industry as of iOS 14, GDPR, etc. So a lot of things to take into consideration. Second uh, main, uh, let's call it challenge, or um, that uh, Bidder is facing is ad user matching. Uh, in simple words, basically we have tons of advertisements, tons of users, and we should match between them, uh, it, between both of them. Basically, since there are many ads, each one of them has its own behavior. For example, um, targeting, pricing, etc. And the goal here, the main goal, is to balance between exploration and exploitation of trends. And eventually, this is something that can be formulated as a recommendation system. By the way, Tabula and some other cool companies are doing such things. Our main challenge, which we'll focus on today's session, is auction pricing. Um, the main question here is basically how much to bid. And how much to bid is a question, on, I'm, I'm talking about the RTB auction, is a question which we can split to two. Uh, first one is how much to bid given that specific user, that specific context. And the second one is how much to bid given the competition that I'm currently in. So for example, um, we have five bidders in this slide. Four of them bid one, two, three dollars, four dollars accordingly. And the fifth one is like, uh, don't know how much to bid. So like one example can be, if he'll bid with 10, he'll probably win, right? But if he'll bid with uh, five, he'll win as well. So the main goal here is basically to minimize the amount that we put on bids. However, we want to maximize, of course, the number of times we will win in the auction. So now we'll describe some approaches for pricing, which are basically part of this industry. So first one, uh, the manual way, as known as the account manager way. An account manager basically can set prices um, manually. So for example, let's set prices zero to 10 to users from Israel, prices 10 to 20 uh, users from US, etc. Very common in the, in the industry, not scalable at all, bad way, not the data way we can say. Second method is called with some kind of a propensity model. And basically that means uh, we can train some kind of a binary classifier. Um, binary classifier can be anything you know, XGBoost, uh, logistic regression, neural network, etc. Given that we want to predict some kind of, a, let's say, probability of click, for example, in our use case, so we get that, that probability, we can multiply that probability with some kind of a configuration information that we have, such as the maximum allowed bid, and we can bid based on that price. So numeric example, P, we got some kind of a, a probability of click on a given user, 0 0.7, the maximum allowed bid, 5, bid price will be 3.5 accordingly. However, there is something um, that bothers with this method, uh, it, uh, is that this method assumes that there is some kind of a linear relationship between the, win the bid price and the probability. And what do I mean by that? So this graph basically presents this phenomena. As long as we increase the price, that's what we expect using this model. As long as we, ex we ex increase the price, we will, we'll, we'll actually think that uh, the probability of win is going to be higher and higher in a linear rate. Like if we'll bid, sorry? But you do have a Spearman coordination. Questions in the end, yeah, sure. I'll answer it, but thanks. Um, so basically, we do think that there is a linear rate um, of increasing the price and increasing the probability of win. However, in reality, it's not like that. Uh, let's say given some kind of a context, for example, um, banner. So banner prices, for those who know, are actually pretty low. Let's say um, zero to two, for example. So within this range of zero to two, you might have um, a probability, um, let's say, um, ad ads, types that are not banner, you might have like a very low amount of probability of winning. And then you have this spike, which actually describes that prices from that range beyond, you have a very high amount of probability uh, of winning. So eventually you won't have a real linear uh, relationship between the price and the probability of winning. The third and the main method, uh, which we'll describe today, is called multi bandit And basically, it is a, a strategy or a method of choosing um, an individual, choosing, trying to choose um, from a set of options. So what do I mean by that? The classic uh, handbook example is when a gambler gets into a casino and trying to uh, pull relevant arms, 
that uh, might maximize his reward. And what he's willing to get is eventually he would like to maximize his reward given the fact that there are many slots relevant, but each one of them is with some kind of an unknown distribution. Basically, this method can work well. However, it's, it's not taking into consideration uh, the context. And what do I mean by context? Again, users' features, for example, uh, geo, uh, users' age, and some other cool parameters that we can uh, take use. So given, let's say, two users, each one of them um, is trying to, I don't know, one from US, one from UK. Eventually, both of them will get um, the, same, uh, the same prediction because we're not dealing with like the same uh, set of, we're, we are dealing with the same parameters for each of them. And eventually, this is, this is a type of a problem uh, that we're trying to balance between exploration and exploitation. Where exploring can be, um, you know, try to pull whatever arm you have, and exploiting is actually, given that we know some information about, about arms, we can use and pull only these arms in order to maximize our reward. Here comes in place uh, contextual bandits. Cool, so contextual bandits, um, basically uh, as a classic example, as a classic handbook example, Contextual bandit is uh, relevant for categorical uh, variables. So, for example, uh, we want to show the user uh, ads from uh, with, a diff with different colors. So we have a green color, um, uh, purple, blue, and black. And each one of them will produce some kind of a probability. Now, each of these arms actually represents a model. So, for example, um, logistic regression, each one of them. Logistic regression, uh, XGBoost, neural network, etc. And this probability will be based on our, um, on our goal. And for example, in the classic handbook example, our goal is to show the user the ad that he will be mostly likely to click on. And now what's the, the main difference is basically that we have the context. And the context is a set of features that are relevant to the user. So for example, context can be user geo, um, ad type, for example, banner, user age, and some other parameters that are relevant. Each one of them is get as an input, I mean, as some kind of a vector. Each one of them is getting as an input to the model, and the model will produce us some kind of um, probability that the user will be likely to click on the ad. Then we get some kind of a feedback, let's say one in case we had one, um, we had meaning that the user had clicked on the ad, and zero otherwise. And well, using that feedback, we will update our beliefs. And by updating our beliefs, I mean that there are several strategies such as Thompson sampling, uh, for those who know Epsilon Greedy, beyond of this scope. But then once we update our beliefs, we actually can retrain the whole process again and again. What actually we managed to do is taking this, um, this attitude into prices and into, into ordinal variables. And what do I mean by that? So ordinal variables are like, for example, bit price. Now each model uh, represents a bin of prices or a price. So one, for example, stands for prices between zero to two, three prices two to four, and you get the point. Now, uh, given a context that will be inserted into each of the models, we'll get some kind of a probability. And now our objective is a bit different because we actually want to make sure that we win and we win the auction. And that's like our objective. So it's like, uh, again, some kind of a classification problem, if whether, whether we won or lost the auction, but using some other um, uh, objective here. We get the, the feedback one in case we won, and we retrain the model following that update again and again. Basically, nothing using this method, nothing pre prevents the model from bidding like the highest bid. So like in, in that case, we won with the price of seven, Nothing prevents uh, from using seven and again and again and again. And this, I think, is something critical because it's actually the place for creativity. And what do I mean by that? There are several strategies that we tried weren't in any of the, let's call it papers and like tutorials that we, we read, read about. Uh, and there are several um, methods, I think, that each, 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 everyone can try and actually be much smarter in terms of not bidding the highest, because if we'll bid just the high price again, again, a high price again, again, what will happen is that we'll end our budget very, very fast. So um, method number one of preventing this phenomena can be using some kind of a custom reward function. And method number two is applying some kind of an aggregation strategy, and we'll walk them through now.
cool custom reward so custom reward function basically means that uh, we're using the the old uh, f let's call it the old um, schema we're just updating the relevant model that had won or that had been used during the last auction so in case of winning or losing the auction we will update that particular model using custom reward we basically use some kind of a mutual information that is passing by between the, um, the bandits or the models because for example uh, in the case of ordinal variables we have let's say five so if we had one with five maybe in the next iteration in the next auction we want to try out three Maybe we can win, but with a cheaper price. As opposed to that, if we had lost with five, we'll probably lost with the, going to lose with three and one accordingly. So we might give them some kind of a reward or a feedback as well. Same goes with seven or some other um, arms. Second method that you, want, that you may try is basically discarding this set of probabilities or as opposed to that, injecting some kind of a business logic. This is called aggregation strategy. What do I mean by that? There are several methods, but for example, one yeah, you'll see in, in, in the coding example in a bit, but basically you can define some kind of a, win, a desired win rate that um, you're willing to get. And using that win rate, you can re-estimate your probabilities that are given based on the model's output and we retrain the model again and again. You'll see a coding example in a bit. Cool. Let's uh, put it all together like as an example, just to make sure we're clear. So let's say we have some kind of a context. A context can be a specific request from a specific user wanting to see an ad at this moment. Um, let's say its age is 30, GOUS and ad type banner. Then, and this is something a bit architectural, but basically we have a set of arms which can be calculated, let's say via some kind of a batch job based on that context so it is known based on our his data uh, let's say historical data that the arms are being uh, the ar the prices of let's say banner in us are being distributed between one to six in this uh, example so we can like calculate relevant uh, arms accordingly and uh, combine them combine them here together then each one of them has its own probability of winning the auction based on our beliefs and our training again and again and we're using some kind of an aggregation strategy we can generate some a, a bit price this bit price will eventually uh, compete within the rtb auction and then when we go to the rtb auction we get some kind of a feedback a reward accordingly which will be based on whether we had won or lost the auction then what will happen is that we'll need to retrain our process again and again using of course some kind of a custom reward because we want to give a feedback to not only a specific arm but rather to all of the arms that got participated or even all of the arms cool uh, main takeaways so this is this is something that can be heard as some kind of a cliche but basically context matters a lot and you gotta know your data and this is something that you can achieve by doing a lot of uh, analysis, uh, like exploratory data analysis in terms of what the context that matters, um, what's the best X, let's call it, um, what is the most relevant parameters for you. This also can be achieved, of course, by feature selection, uh, which there are several methods that you can use and I'll see, you'll see a slide in a bit. Second thing is that ordinal arms offer more feedback. Um, this is something that is um, as opposed to categorical variables, we can use these multiple updates or custom reward that we implemented that helped us a lot. And third thing I think is the creativity point. So we can use the custom reward function, aggregation strategy, and I believe that there are more because the, um, the problem is pricing is now getting, uh, let's call it more popular. So definitely a lot of more room for uh, creativity. Cool, last slide, basically this slide shows, um, I'm not going to like to, Let's deep dive into, but basically the x-axis is the number of iterations we tried within some kind of experiment. The y-axis stands for our loss function. In our case, it was MAE, mean absolute error. And basically, what, we want, what I want to show here is that the context size really matters. It's not that as long as you add more context, uh, let's say context size equals two is uh, device OS, one hot encoded, iOS one, uh, Android zero, etc., and Geo. So it's not as, as long as, as you add the more context, uh, the error is going to be lower. However, context really hel helps as opposed to no context at all. 
Now you'll have a short coding example by Uri, and then uh, we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay, so as Daniel mentioned, unlike um, the classical multi on bandit we have multiple inputs. Every time we want with $5, we also update, for example, 7, 9, etc. because obviously we would have won also with higher prices. Uh, I wanted to share a real cool uh, PyPI module called Contextual Bandits by a guy named David Cortez, but it's actually very well maintained and it's actually solved all the problems we had. We wanted to build a framework that can train the contextual bandits for any SKLR module and we wanted our models to have a predict proba function for predict probability and to have a partial fit and we even started to implement it and then we discovered that someone else uh, pitted to it and it's actually a great product so I highly recommend uh, using it for contextual bandits. Uh, this library actually supports both online learning and contextual bandits for offline learning. We are obviously more interested in the online model. And let's see a, a very short demo. Um, for privacy purposes, it will be on simulated data, but I can assure you that it works just as well on Fiber's real data. Okay, so what you need in order to use this library is to have a model any kind of model that has the partial fit, meaning that I can train it incrementally, and that it can predict the probability. Okay, so there are uh, several models. Uh, neural nets are one class of them. Uh, here we use logistic regression. Just a technical note, the different implementation of logistic regression does not have a partial fit, but you can use a logistic regression via the SGD class classifier with the logistic loss. So same model, different class name. Okay, so in order to test whether the models are learning, we try to simulate the data. And here we simulated prices according to this distribution, meaning that users from Germany that are using an Android device would be approximately $4. We also added some noise in order to make it uh, more realistic. And for example, uh, iOS users from the US uh, would be worth, as give or take, uh, $9. So we randomized data according to this uh, joint dist uh, distribution. And we wanted to see how quick does our model pick that up. Okay, so we synthesized the data. And very conveniently, we have a data frame already one hot encoded with random data according to that distribution. Now a good uh, moment to notice the differences between reinforcement learning, contextual bandits, and supervised learning. In supervised learnings, we have X and Y, the features and the target. And in contextual bandits, reinforcement learning, we have the features, the action that we're going to take, the action going to be, for example, bid $5 or bid $10, and the reward. The reward is what that action actually, uh, how much money we pocketed in. Okay, so the contextual bandits library uses this notation. Instead of X and Y, X, R, and A. Uh, Daniel mentioned the aggregation strategy. And our aggregation strategy uh, it's pretty simple, but it took us a lot of time uh, to think about it, which is essentially, if you're going to win 100% of the times, you're paying too much. If you're going to win 0% of the times, you're not bidding enough. So we have an, an additional hyperparameter, which is the amount, the percentage of time we want to win. And we try to optimize for that number. So the closer a model is to our desired win rate, the more likely we are going to uh, select it. So we used some function, it doesn't really matter, that gets uh, higher as we get closer to our desired win rate. Here we, it's a, a fraction of uh, one over the difference between the probability and the desired win rate and some kind of exponent just for the fun of it. But as long as the function uh, increases 
as we are closer to the desired win rate, the more likely we are going to select that arm. And we essentially patched the predict proba function of the original SGD classifier. Using this patch, we can run the library as is with our uh, domain knowledge. So for this example, we assume that the bid is between $0 and $10, and our resolution is uh, one cent. So we have 1,000 buckets, just for uh, our demonstration purposes. And we simulate a real auction. So this is the, reg the regret. In contextual bandits, we measure the optimal price minus the price that we bid. It doesn't look that good when you look at it like that. But it's worth mentioning that this is a stochastic process. So we need some kind of smoothing in order to see the underlying trend. And once you smooth it a bit, you can see that actually the regret does decline. And unfortunately, it also increases in this uh, specific uh, execution. And you can see that the model does learn something. So we have another, we, we know how we sample the data and you know, we know the true distribution. Let's see if the model picked that up. So for users with, from the US, using an Android device, the actual bid is supposed to be seven, and our bandit bid, seven point something, 7.2. And as you can see, it's relatively close. So the model did learn and did converge to the true distribution of the data. Now, the question is, how does the context matter? Do I really need those two features? Maybe I can use only one of them. So we demonstrated here that when we use only one feature, the results are significantly worse. For example, the overall regret for uh, the two, this context of size two is uh, 0 0.54. And for any individual feature, the overall regret is much higher. But we can see, for example, that the prices are actually not that accurate. So the model really could not pick up the true distribution uh, with, a, with an incomplete context. Okay, so that's it. Um, any questions? Summing it up, you, you might, maybe I got it wrong, it's kind of a mix. It's combining a multi unbounded and collaborate filter. It's multi unbounded with collaborate filter that you make some kind of a context which is kind of a collaborate filter and kind of merge it. I think that the main takeaway here is the ordinal relations because in multi unbounded you don't have the relations between yeah. different colors and here you can actually know you learn faster because yeah. you have you need less input. Yeah, collaborate filter, what does it mean? That I don't know you, but I know your brother, so maybe I can use the information from your brother. So here, like you did the, like you did your optimization or sort of optimization on your brother, but they can but then I can do that, use this, this context about you, and I'll be in a better place if I won't do that. But unlike collaborative filtering, we have another um, information. We have the ordinal. For example, I can't say which one is bigger, you or your brother, but I can't say that five dollars is less than yeah, six. Of course, you have it in the Monte Alba. Yeah. Okay. Could you go back to the learning process with it, where there's uh, two graphs? There's a, like a, the first one? Yeah. So this is the, uh, you start. Uh, can you can you repeat uh, this this this? Uh... To rerun it, yeah. uh, it will take. No, no. Can you repeat the explanation? Uh, like, sure. This is it's an absolute value or something. It's always positive. Here. So this is it's always positive, and this is the difference between the actual bid and the bid at the bandit uh, bid. So it's it's the absolute value of the okay. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe to the end, but you mentioned you're trying to maximize the, the, the winnings given a certain budget. 
So did you consider some kind of knapsack formulation? Because it's kind of two different objectives. We did not. So we did try other models and we also tried other bandit formulations, for example, the gamma exponential model. We tried to model the price as a continuous variable and not as an ordinal. It did not perform as well as uh, this uh, formulation. Mm -hmm. How do you determine the number of points? That's a, a great question, and I don't have an answer to it. It's, it's trial and error. Yeah, so uh, what was a bit weird for me, you said you were trying to reach a certain win rate or something, that you're, you're aiming for that, which is, it doesn't sound like a, really your, your goal here, right? Your goal here is, is to maximize your revenue eventually. You can't, can't you just formalize that in the sense of, you know, what's my, my gain if I win? Times, I don't know, probability of the user clicking or whatever. Yes, it's way too right? So, so can, can't you just this way reach sort of the goal function? So that, that's a good point. So what Erez mentioned is that we are, not, we are not optimizing here for the objective of uh, amount of money in the bank, right? We are optimizing for a win rate. And it's actually, we had a slide for that. So the phenomena we encountered is that the probability of win is very, it's very hard to predict. So essentially the bandits are learning this curve. So I'm trying to fix the probability of win, desired win rate, and the bandits learn the approximate, the, the appropriate uh, price. And it really depends on other business logic down the line. A few years ago, I was working in a firm that tried to find this uh, sweet point, that jumping point, and does using it use help or it's... So I guess that there are also other solutions to try and model this curve. But maybe you can combine it because basically what you try to optimize is not something for a philosophy reason. You want to, to opt to do the bidding and the bidding is based on this uh, phenomenon. So there's also a lot of work, a lot of additional work to be done. This is uh, only one aspect of, uh, uh, yeah, one uh, last question, please. So for this chart, why isn't like a regular calibration work? And the process, because it looks like a regular sigma, you can just calibrate it against the expected or against the results. So it's, it's a great question. So the question was why uh, don't we use like regular calibration, straight from SKLearn? And my only answer is empirical. It didn't work just as well as our uh, contextual bandit framing. Okay, so thank you.